This is the story of Egypt Air Flight 804. On the 18th of May 2016, an Airbus A320 took off from Paris's Charles de Gaulle Airport with 66 people on board. The plane took off in the cold night sky and turned towards Cairo, its final destination. The flight went off without a hitch. Through the night, the plane went through Swiss, Italian, Croatian, Serbian, Albanian, Greek, and finally Egyptian airspace, all without a problem. At 11.22 p.m. UTC, the jet entered Greek airspace, and it was at 37,000 feet. The controllers cleared the jet to fly direct towards the waypoint Kumbi, which was on the boundary between Greek and Egyptian airspace. The controller transferred the jet over to Egyptian control. Once the controller handed the plane off, he went about assisting other planes. But Flight 804 never really replied. The jet was 14.8 nautical miles to the north of Kumbi, and the controller tried hailing them again, but still no reply. The controller called up Cairo Area Control to see if they had heard from the jet, but weirdly enough, they had not as well. The controller was now worried and tried to hail the plane again, and still no reply. Then at 7.1 nautical miles north of Kumbi, the plane was no longer on the radar screens. Flight 804 was lost, and no one on the ground had any idea why. The controller got on the horn with the Greek Air Force to let them know that the plane had been lost. Then, a satellite high above the Mediterranean picked up an ELT, or Emergency Locator Transmitter Signal, from Flight 804. This meant that the plane had hit the water, and the salt water had activated the ELT transmitter, meaning that the plane had crashed. Within minutes, jets and rescue assets from both Greece and Egypt were on station, scouring for survivors that they would never find. The loss of Flight 804 was a perplexing one. There were no mayday calls, no signs of trouble. One moment the plane was fine, the next moment it was hurtling towards the Mediterranean Sea. The task of recovering what was left of the plane would be no easy feat. The radar track and the ELT gave them a rough idea of where the plane would be, but they would still need to bring in large specialized ships with powerful sonars to find the wreck. Thus, on the 31st of May 2016, the ship the Laplace joined the search for Flight 804. Once on station, they had luck right off the bat. They found some wreckage and were almost immediately able to detect the ping from one of the flight data recorders. The data recorders were salvaged and some debris was brought up. They hoped that whatever brought down this jet was in the pieces that they had. Immediately, they had something to go off of. The pieces that they were pulling up from the bottom of the sea and the parts that they had found on the surface were bent and beaten up. Now, at this point, you may be saying, yeah, Mr. Mini Air Crash Investigation, you'd expect that from a plane that fell into the ocean from 37,000 feet. For instance, they found a food trolley that was floating in the water. This trolley was built out of composite materials covered in metals. Now, this trolley was found to be, quote, folded inside out to the extent that it lost its structure, end quote. You wouldn't expect damage like that from a plane hitting the water, no matter how fast you come down, at least according to the Egyptian authorities. Other things that they recovered shone more light on what happened on board Flight 804 and its last seconds. They found some crew baggage, a headrest, some seat covers, a backpack, and a whole host of other items that were afflicted by the same thing, heat. Flight 804 was violently and suddenly overcome by fire. The only question is, why? With the flight data recorder data in tow, they could paint a picture of what happened in the last moments of Flight 804. From 12.29 a.m. and 26 to 12.29 and 45 seconds, that is, in under 19 seconds, the plane lost 13 computer systems. This included the SEC-3, the TCAS, the rudder pedal sensor, the FAC-2, the FMGC-2, and so on. A lot of these sensors were returning random implausible values before going dark. For instance, the rudder pedal sensor oscillated between 2047 and minus 1024 newtons of force. The flyer on Flight 804 was eating through the innards of the plane, and it was taking critical systems with it. But, most importantly, the flight data recorders remained functioning for long enough that we know how the fire spread. The first alarm to go off was the lavatory fire warning, and then the avionic smoke error. 
but the flight data recorder also let us know that the crew of Flight 804 didn't need a warning to know that they were on fire. The CVR picked up a hissing sound, which was identified as oxygen leaking from the first officer's section. The next thing that could be heard was the first officer calling out fire, fire, and the captain confirming. The captain asked for an extinguisher, and the pilots fought the fire the best that they could as the flames ravaged the cockpit and their plane at large. The last words recorded on the CBR was someone asking for the forgiveness of God. The voice recorder showed just how quickly everything fell apart. At 1225-24, this is a normal flight. Then at 1229-54, the flight recorder cuts out. How does a fire spread that quickly and then take out an entire plane? Looking at history, in the case of Swiss Air 111 or Air Canada 797, you had time to mount some sort of an offensive against the fire, but that was not the case of Flight 804. Now, this is where everything starts to fall apart in the case of the investigation. According to the Egyptians, they had detected trace amounts of TNT and other explosive material in the wreck. They also found TNT on the victims of Flight 804. Thus, according to the Egyptians, an explosive device brought down Flight 804. This is unheard of in the modern aviation age, and the implications of this are even more serious. If this is true, someone was able to smuggle an explosive device onto a passenger jet through one of the busiest airports in Europe. The security ramifications are massive and truly scary. The long and short of it is that there was an explosion and that caused a fire, and that fire ultimately took the plane down. From the Egyptian perspective, this was an open and shut case. Someone blew up the plane. But the weird thing is, no one claimed the loss of Flight 804. I mean, if you're going to take down a passenger airliner, I feel like you would take responsibility for it. I mean, there's a reason why you did that in the first place. There's also the issue of the BEA, the French investigative authority, not agreeing with the Egyptian report about there being a bomb on board. They say that there was a fire on board, but they never say that there was an explosion. The Egyptians said that they detected TNT and other chemicals that only come from an explosive device. That should be pretty easy to prove and can be independently verified by the French authorities. Moreover, the French authorities were not able to find any explosive residue on the French individuals that were on Flight 804. Now, this is weird. If you've been in the world of aviation investigations, then you'll know that this is nothing new. Egyptian authorities have a history of disagreeing with their global investigative counterparts. Now, you might be wondering, why would the Egyptians do this? The aviation journalist William Languish has this to say. Quote, In the case of the Egyptians, they were following a completely different line of thinking. It seemed to me that they knew that their man, Batuti, had done this. They were pursuing a political agenda that was driven by the need to answer to their higher-ups in a very pyramidal, autocratic political structure. The word had been passed down from on high, probably from Mubarak himself, that there was no way that Batuti, the co-pilot, could have done this. For the accident investigators in Egypt, the game then became not pursuing the truth, but backing the official line. End quote. This is very much in line with the investigation that unfolded after the crash of Flight 804. Now, if all of this wasn't enough, this is where an absolute bombshell drops. The Italian newspaper called the Corriere della Sera published a report that said that they had seen documents that were presented to French authorities that said that the first officer was smoking in the cockpit, and that is what caused the fire in the cockpit. My first reaction to this was that there's no way that something like this would happen. I mean, no one in their right mind would smoke on a plane. And then, even if someone were smoking on a plane, how could that start a raging inferno that might just take down an entire passenger jet? Well, ironically, the answer to that came from the Egyptian report. The first sign of trouble on Flight 804 wasn't a fire warning or an explosion, but a light hiss. All microphones in the cockpit picked up this very faint hissing sound. The investigators needed to know where it came from and what it was. They were able to isolate the sound to the oxygen flow system on the side of the first officer. Now they needed to know why that sound was there. They put the oxygen flow system in different states and listened to the sounds that it made to see what matched up with what was recorded on Flight 804. They found out that the sounds that they heard matched up if the oxygen system on the first officer's side was set 
to the emergency setting. This meant that the oxygen system on the right hand side of the plane was pumping oxygen into the area. As they poured over the documents about the plane, they found out that the oxygen box on the first officer's side had just been replaced two days before the crash. The person that replaced the oxygen box left an emergency knob open, allowing oxygen to flow into the cockpit. Now, I know that this doesn't seem like a huge deal, but take a look at what happened at Egypt Air Flight 667. In that case, a fire started in the emergency oxygen system on the first officer's side that spread so quickly that the fire burned a gaping hole in the side of the plane. Since the plane was on the ground, no one was hurt, but the plane was damaged so badly that it had to be written off. Now imagine that happening at 37,000 feet. They would have no chance of fighting that fire. The investigators of Flight 667 were not able to find out what exactly started the fire. But they had a couple of theories. Some wire sleeves were missing, and that might have caused a tiny spark that could have started this fire. Or they considered the heating of the pipes when so much oxygen was pumped into the system. That also was a serious consideration. The point I'm making here is that it doesn't take much to light an oxygen system on fire, and a lit cigarette in the cockpit in the right place certainly fits the bill. What's even more crazy is that it was absolutely legal for pilots to smoke in the cockpit at Egypt Air when this crash happened. They've changed that since then. This means that we have to come to a sobering conclusion that Flight 804 was most probably brought down by someone in the cockpit smoking. There is no grand conspiracy. It was just a bad idea, something as stupid as smoking a cigarette in the cockpit that brought down an entire passenger jet. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.